This message today is lions, tigers, and bears. We're going to look at the difference between worry and concern. Because there is a difference. And we're going to look at the words of Jesus. How many of you believe what Jesus says? Amen. So we're going to look at Matthew 6, beginning with verse 25. And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear, because life is more than that. He says, can any one of you, in verse 27, by worrying at a single hour to your life? And the answer is no. He says, can by worrying, can you add an inch to your height? No. Okay. So he says, look at the lilies of the field. And they are more beautifully adorned than Solomon himself. And look at the little sparrow, common little bird that falls to the ground, my eye is on it. How much more valuable you are than the flowers of the field. He says, oh, you have a little faith. Don't worry. Saying, what will we do, eat, drink, and so forth and so on? How will we handle life? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. In Matthew 33, 34. There we go. Therefore, do not worry. Go on. Keep up with me because I want them to see this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow will worry about itself. In other words, you know, we worry about things that may not even happen. So at least wait till they happen, Jesus is saying, <laughs> because each day has its own challenges. All right. So he says, don't worry. Do not worry. Well, one of the characteristics of worry is that it strangles the life out of you. You know, the word worry in English comes from an old German word meaning to strangle. Have you ever thought of that? It strangles your energy. It strangles out your faith. And so something or someone or some event can cause a source of unhappiness or insecurity in you about something that may or may not happen, or if it does happen, it has a solution. They got to this before I was ready for it, but that's okay. Characteristics of worry, okay? And the characteristics of concern. Worry is when you're driven by fear. God does not drive us. He's a shepherd. Jesus is a shepherd. He leads us. Okay, so anytime you're being pushed in your emotions toward fear, that is not your good shepherd. He motivates us. He fills us with hope and inspiration to follow him by faith. And so we have to understand that fear and faith are both belief systems. Fear believes in bad things. Faith believes, believes in good things. Fear believes that the devil is bad and he's going to do bad things against your life. But faith believes that God is good all the time and is going to do good things in your life. That's why we can say with the scriptures, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. His good will overcome any bad thing that the enemy tries to throw at me. So worry is driven by fear, and concern is motivated by faith. And then worry often paralyzes us, okay? It stops us from moving forward. We just go, no, I can't do this. You know, I can't go there. I can't be that because we become stuck and paralyzed 
but concern promotes constructive action. Concern is proactive. It sees a solution, and it moves forward. Worry doesn't have a goal. It just has anguish and anxiety. But concern focuses on a goal. And our goal is that Jesus be glorified, be seen in every matter of our lives. Hello? So we have a goal, and we want to always focus on Jesus. We are a Christ-centered people. So we don't just look at the circumstances. We look at Jesus, and we're filled with hope, and we activate faith, and we're concerned we're not living in denial. We're living in reality that there are problems, but we're not going to be blocked from living an abundant life because of situations, people, events, whatever. I want you to look at a little movie clip from The Wizard of Oz. And when you're through looking at it, I'm going to quiz you on a certain attitude that you're going to see, whether it's worry or concern. Do you suppose we'll meet any wild animals? Mm, we might. Animals that, that eat straw? Uh, some, but mostly lions and tigers and bears. Lions? And tigers? And bears. <laughs> lions and tigers and bears? Oh, my! Lions, lions and tigers and bears! Oh, my! 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 Well, you can stop it. They encounter a lion, but he's a more scaredy cat than they are, okay? But in this movie of The Wizard of Oz, and you have to understand that in so many movies, there is a psychological message. There's even at times a the theological, a, a God message in movies purposely that screenwriters write into it. And it, the story of The Wizard of Oz is a story about a journey. And here the scarecrow and the tin man and Dorothy are about to go on the journey and then they begin to think about what they might encounter. And the scarecrow asks, will there be animals that eat straw? Because he's made of straw. How many times do you think, oh my God, you know, life is gonna swallow me up. This circumstance is gonna eat me. I often recommend this, I've done it in other sermons, but for young college graduates or people that are going to apply for jobs, there's a wonderful motivational book for having an interview for a job or employment, and it's called They Can't Eat You, okay? So you go in there knowing they can't eat you, so you know they may reject you and not hire you, but they can't eat you. And so the scarecrow was just so scared that the challenge ahead of them would be something that would just devour him. But the tin man wisely says, well, maybe we'll find animals that eat straw, or maybe not. But we might face lions, tigers, and bears. And Dorothy goes, oh my, Lions, tigers, and bears. So is Dorothy's, oh my, worry or concern? It's concern. She's concerned. How do we know it's not worry? Because they go forward. Their goal is to meet a wizard. God forbid, that's not our goal. Our goal is to glorify Jesus Christ and be able to walk through every door of opportunity that he has prepared for us and not be paralyzed by fear. So they link arms together, and that's why you're here today, because we're better together. We encourage one another. We motivate one another with our testimonies, with our good words of faith. And they link arms, and they begin, oh, my, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. Lions, tigers, and bears. And you see them gaining momentum. Lions, tigers. Yes, we're going to have challenges. Yes, we may 
encounter giants, lions, tigers, and bears, but we're going to go forward on our journey. And that's the same way we are called to live, not paralyzed by anxiety or worry, knowing there's going to be challenges in our lives, but we can go forward going. That's what David, King David, he said, you know, lions, tigers, and bears. Here's Goliath, but <laughs> by the power of God, I have slain the bear and the lion, <laughs> not the tiger, but we have to just get that attitude, lion, tigers, and bears. Oh my, I'm concerned, but I'm not paralyzed. I'm going to go forward because I have faith in God that he has good things planned for me, and I don't want to miss them. Worry is destructive. It strangles us. It's misplaced attitudes. It's what ifs? The what ifs? What if I fail? What if they don't like me? What if I die? What if I crash? What if I burn? What if, you know, all the what ifs? It's getting stuck, like we've already said. And worry looks for trouble. And worry overthinks everything instead of focusing on Jesus. But concern says, okay, this might happen on our journey. Jesus said, before you set out, count the cost. Okay, there's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some problems. Some people think that if they're in the will of God, everything is going to be so easy. I've found that when you're in the will of God and something is hard, don't give up. If it's hard, it means there's gold in them there hills, okay? You persevere. You keep going and doing what God has challenged you to do. Okay, so... Um, you know, the tin man had concern. He said it might be, but unlikely that we'll find animals that can eat us or devour us, but we're not going to get stuck. We're going to focus on reaching the bigger goal. Concern cares, okay? It does not live in denial. It sees reality, but it doesn't dwell on the negative. It believes God for solutions in every challenge. So we want to choose faith and choose concern over worry. Now, in the ministry that the Lord has given to me, there came a time when it grew to the point that I could no longer meet my assignments on the Greyhound bus, which I used in the beginning, or by train, which I used in the beginning. But now I would have to fly because I was going to be crisscrossing from east to west, east to west, west to east, north to south, south to north, constantly to fulfill the open doors that God had for me. And so I had a problem. I was terrified of flying. I, I, I don't know if I can do this. I, I knew that I, I had an open door. I had a calling. But I was miserable before I would take the flights with fear and worry. Even after we were married, and I'd already been to probably, well, in total, I think I've preached in 17 nations around the world. I could not have gotten to those nations without getting on an airplane. And sometimes flying for 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, to get to those destinations. And even after we were married, even after we were pastoring here, I would still just get clammy and fearful and, and, and just agonize over getting on a plane. Many times at the airport, even here in Laredo and in other places, my mind would start working, even as I checked in and was walking to get on the stairs up the plane, that I was hearing Holy Ghost signals saying, daughter, don't get on this plane. It is going to crash, okay? And I would think, this is my chance to walk away and be led of the Spirit and not fly. Many times that happened, but I had to say, Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. As I would go up the stairs to get into the plane. I remember sitting on planes where I would start breathing heavily and my heart would flutter and I'd feel my hands getting clammy. And I was beginning to feel claustrophobic and anxiety of being shut in this little metal little metal thing, 30 
thousand feet in the air. I remember a couple of times looking at the door and thinking, I'm just going to open that door. I bet I can open that door. I'm just going to jump out. I got to get out of this place. But I think, well, if I do that, for sure I'm going to die, and I'm going to cause all the people on the plane to die. So I would sit there because I'm a realist, but it was just an overwhelming feeling of anxiety, and it wasn't fun at all, at all. But as time went on, God was so gracious. I was in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, in a meeting, and a lady that did not know anything about my emotions about traveling, she came to me and she says, the Lord has a word for you, Sandra, and it is this, you will paint the skies with God's glory. Thank you, shepherd, good shepherd not driving me to continue to be wrung out and strangled by my worry of death by flight, <laughs> but giving me your promise. I will paint the skies for your glory. So I'd get on planes, I'd buckle up, I'd look out the window, and I'd say, I'm painting the skies with your glory, Lord. Your glory is his manifest presence, is his presence, that his presence was there, and his presence was all around the plane, and I would arrive at my destination safely. I cannot tell you that every time that happened, I was just, you know, a cheerful little Christian. I still would feel the pressure of the worry. So I went to the Lord, and I said, I know that you're true, and your word is truth, that I will paint the skies with your glory. But Lord, I need some help here. See, that's what concern does. I have a concern, but there is a solution to this concern. And I said, God, what should I do? And I often say, this is why I have a flat head. When God gives the answer, I go, I should have thought of that. It's so simple right in front of you. And he said, don't take your study books. And because I would get on a plane and I would work on my sermons that I was going to have to speak at the conference. I'd finish up editing, changing, endeavoring to memorize. I'd be, and so all of the stress of the responsibilities that I was going to would go on top of the negativity of flying. And he said, don't do that anymore. Don't do I don't want you working. I don't want you studying. I want you to go and buy books that you enjoy. So I got into John Grisham murder mysteries, okay? And I would buy John Grisham books because they're like literary candy to read. You don't have to use much brain cells to read them. They're intriguing. They're clean. And, and so I would read John Grisham. Or the Lord would say, go get a beautiful romance novel about the area. And sometimes I get them to the geographic area, if I was flying to France or if I was flying to Italy or if I was flying to, to New York, I would get novels of romance that involved that area. So I would get to learn things about the history and all of that and the love affair. And, and, and I'd get so into it, I would forget that I was 30,000 feet in the air, okay? And I would be calm. There were solutions. There's solutions for your anxiety. There's solutions for... The that which tries to strangle the life out of you. We go to the Lord. He's for you. He's not against you. His plans are good plans. He wants to do good things in our lives. And so we want to be faith people. Jesus doesn't berate us if we have anxiety or anxiousness or, or if we're worry warts. He doesn't berate us. He says if you have faith, like a tiny little seed of mustard. He said, use it. What he's saying is, you know, don't give up. Don't give up and succumb into a life filled with worry and misery. But use your faith and begin to climb out of that hole and look at me that I am with you and I will hold you in my arms and give you solutions for the things that concern your life. Well, life went on, and, and I was I remember a time I could tell you story after story of air travel, but I was on a flight out of Los Angeles, and you take off, and you're over the Pacific Ocean, and we just kept going round and round in circles for 45 minutes to an hour out in the Pacific Ocean, and under the seat, I could feel the vibrations of the plane, and it would go, and then he'd just keep flying around. And I could feel the vibration. I said, something is wrong with this plane. And after about an hour, 
And I'm saying, I will paint the skies for your glory. I will paint the skies for your glory. I will paint the skies for your glory. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. I'm in this thing. <laughs> I got to see it through. And all of a sudden, I thought, tum, tum. and the pilot said, we were having a problem getting our landing gear up. So I didn't know if we were going to have to go back to the airport in Los Angeles, but the landing gear has locked, and we are on our way to Chicago. So we fly across the country, and just days or short time previous to that, in Chicago there had been a horrific airplane crash at the airport, and everyone on board had died. It had been incinerated in fire. And so... When we got to the airport and we flew over and circled, you saw the crater where this other airplane had crashed, and everything was black from the fire. And you're going, okay, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. I will paint the sky for your glory. And we had a safe landing. When I was debarking for the plane, the pilot came out of his cabin, and I said, thank you, sir, for this safe landing. I was concerned about the landing gear, if it would come out. And he smiled. He said, you had every right to be concerned. So was I. <laughs> and so, yes, but I, I was worried. I was concerned. But yet, I know that God is in control. I was flying from Dallas back home to Laredo after a preaching assignment when we were in the little tiny American Eagle planes that were these tiny little things. And there was a hurricane that hit Round Rock, Austin, and really did a lot of damage. And we, they let us take off, but we got in the middle of that storm between Dallas and, and Austin. And it was horrendous. I've been in turbulence. I mean, I was on a plane in New Mexico that had to land at a race car, racetrack, because of a sandstorm and all the sand getting in the engines. And that was not a fun ride, okay? Norma and I were in a plane going to Brazil, and there was a loud explosion. And all of the, the stewardess began to panic and run for cover. And we thought, oh, my gosh. And when they get scared, we should get scared. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. We're on this journey. We're going forward. And so that day, it was horrible. I mean, the plane went on its side, back on its side, dropped, went up. It was like a little toy being thrown about. It was horrible turbulence. And the lady that was sitting next to me, she was losing it. She got gray. We were concerned she was having a heart attack, and she was just trembling and screaming, mis hijos, mis hijos, mis hijos, no puedo decir adios a mis hijos. And I grabbed her because she was going into severe anxiety. And another passenger, a gentleman who was an executive, he was coming to Laredo on business, and he said, I'm a Christian. I'll pray for her. I said, you pray, and I'll hold her. And I was holding her, and he prayed. I don't even know she heard the prayer. She was screaming so loud. And then I told her, I said, ma'am, we're going to be fine. You're going to see tus hijos. Vas a ver tus hijos. You're going to see your, your children because I'm on this plane. And God is not through with me. He has a mission for me in life. And he said that he would let his presence always be with me when I fly in the air. We're going to arrive in Laredo safe. Calm down. You're going to see your children because God has given me a promise, and I'm not through doing what he's asked me to do. Amen? I minister to myself as much as to that lady. So we move from that type of panic that we feel when we have a loss of control. When we can't be in control. And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. How are my nerves when I'm in a situation that I cannot control? Do I worry or do I give the control to God and say, Lord, I'm concerned about this, but you are in control. Um, you know, when the pilot came out of that plane, in that, that cockpit, cockpit in Chicago, 
um, and said, you had every right to be concerned, so was I. But the thing is, we both continued to have airplane travel as a part of our lives because we have to go forward. We have to go forward. Now, how do we recognize when we have crossed the line from concern, I mean, from, from worry into concern? Well, concern is proactive, okay? It looks for solutions. It develops a strategy. It trusts in the Lord. Worry often visits the past and looks at horrific things that have happened in the past, whether to us or to others, like that airplane crater in Chicago, okay? And then we begin to dwell on that. And we assume that that type of horrific thing will happen in our future. But we have to train ourselves to focus on Jesus. I have a little bottle at home. It's about this tall, about this big around. And it has 480,000 grains of sand in it. Almost half a million. And in it is the scripture, that on, on the bottle is the scripture that says, my thoughts toward you are more than all of the grains of sand on the earth. Wow. And that little bottle is almost a half a million. Can you imagine how many grains of sand are at South Padre Island? How many grains of sand are in Hawaii? How many grains of sand are in Bermuda? How many grains of sand in all of the beaches and under the ocean of this planet? And he says, my thoughts are more than that toward you. He says, you go, you sleep, you rest. I am your Shabbat Shalom. I am your rest and your peace. Shabbat means Sabbath. And Sabbath is Sabado. It's a day of rest. We assemble ourselves in the Western world on Sundays, but the truth of it is Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our place of rest and our place of peace, and he's for us every day of the week, even as David was sharing with us earlier about the presence and blessings of God with us always. So we can sleep and rest knowing that he watches over us. He doesn't sleep. He's constantly thinking about us and preparing ways of escape before we ever recognize that we need to escape, <laughs> that we have a problem, okay? I remember years ago, my mother was building a church in Mexico, and she had told the contractor, I don't have the money for this church, but God does, and I'm not going to be paying you. God's going to be paying you. And the time came to pay the contractor. It was many, many decades ago. And the bill was $100, and she didn't have it. And she went to the Lord, and she said, Lord, I have such a bad testimony. And my focus here in Mexico is to show forth your glory to these people. I owe this man $100, and I need to pay him today. And she opened up her Bible. Lord, give me a promise. Give me a scripture. And she opened it up, and it didn't make any sense. It was like this one begat the other one, begat the other one. And she just couldn't figure out how that would give her any hope for God's solutions. But she realized that the page, when she turned it, was stuck. She opened it up, pried the pages loose, and there was a $100 bill stuck in between the pages. And Mother got all excited, but then she remembered that that was not her Bible. She had lost or misplaced her Bible, and she had borrowed that Bible from some missionaries in a little suburb outside of Monterey. So I went with her that day. She went out in the car, and she knocked on the door, and they came to the door, and, and, and she said, look what I found, a $100 bill. She said, but this is not in my Bible. This is the Bible that you lent to me. And the missionary lady, her name was Mabel, she said, oh, my stars. In other words, like Dorothy, oh, my, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my, lions, tigers, and bears. As we go in the journey, God already has a solution for whatever impossibilities we face. And the missionary Mabel said, oh, my, Sister Baker, 
This is not our Bible either. We were at a mission conference in California, and this elderly gentleman came to us, and he said, here, I want to give you this Bible to take to Mexico. She said, we didn't want to hurt his feelings and say, we can't use English Bibles in Mexico, duh. We need Spanish Bibles. So we took it, and when we loaded up, we just threw it in the trunk of the car, and it was sitting collecting dust on our bookshelf until you came saying, do you have an extra English Bible? And we gave it to you. Oh, my Lions, tigers, and bears, we're going to go forward, folks, because God already has a solution before you know that you have a problem. Okay? He's got it under control. So we can be concerned, but we don't have to be strangled by worry. You know, when Norman and I were living at Harvest House, as we do today, a few years ago, in Del Mar C, there was an invasion of rats. We're not talking about little mice. We're talking about rats. They were roof rats, big Norwegian roof rats, and they were looking for a Norwegian home, and they found Norman, okay? <laughs> and they were everywhere, and they would you, they gnaw through the sheetrock to get through. I mean, it was horrible. They would come through the area where our TV is and walk through our, our den. They were everywhere. And one night, my son and I were laying in my bed, I share with Norman, we were laying there watching some cartoons when all of a sudden I felt like somebody was staring at me, that feeling. And so I turned to look, and here was this big rat walking out of my bathroom with his head up in the air, sniffing and looking to see what he could consume. My son and I, we jumped and we ran out of there. We ran upstairs. We got in the guest room and stood on, stop, on top of a bed in the guest room, screaming for Norman to go in and kill the rat, which he did. But the rat invasion became so bad that finally I told Norman, I'm going to the Holiday Inn. I'm out of here. I am not staying here. If you want to live with rats, live with them. But I am not living in that house. I mean... I remember one day walking out the front door with my sister-in-law, Kathy, and there was this big, fat, gray cat that was laying on top of the arch of our front porch. And he looked at me, and he went, and he was just looking right at me. He was big and fat. And I said, Kathy, maybe he has rabies. And he looked at me like, and she said, no, he's saying, run, fool, run. <laughs> There's so many rats here. <laughs> well, with time, the rats were consumed by feral cats and other things that were done in the neighborhood. It wasn't just us. I thought, my gosh, are we that filthy? But no, it was everywhere. There's a sister in our church that lives a block away from us, and she said, I kept thinking, why are my children coming down and just eating the bottom of the pieces of fruit and then sticking them back in the fruit basket? And she said, till I came down early one morning, and rats were eating the bottoms of the fruit from the fruit. It was gross. Gross. Well, we got rid of them. But I can remember laying in bed at night next to Norman in the dark. And my mind began to go to the past where a friend of mine, a missionary, with her husband in the south, southern part of Mexico, were reaching unreached people in very primitive villages and she had a baby and a two-year-old son and she said Sandra I, I I looked at my babies and I think they're they're breaking out with rash and she said until I noticed that the rashes were increasing and were getting little pus pockets on them and my baby cried one night and I turned the flashlight on and there were rats eating my baby Okay, And I remember laying there and thinking about that. And Norman and I encouraged that couple that their missionary journey to that part of the world was over. Okay, 
and, and they went on to greater fields of prosperity. But I lay there in the dark thinking, I know what happened to those babies with those rats. And that big rat came out of the drain in my jacuzzi. And don't even tell me they come out into the toilet or I'm in trouble, okay? <laughs> but, but I begin to think about the rats. I do sometimes when I, I'm going to the bathroom. I do look in that toilet and think, oh, in the name of Jesus, lions, tigers, and bears. <laughs> I'm going forward, okay? But, <laughs> but I would lay there and think about that rat. And I just began to feel anxious. And then I would think, okay, I'm going to... If I, go to, if I go to sleep, I just stare into the dark and I go, if I go to sleep and I'm between that, that twilight zone, between sleep and being awake and you can't move and you can't do anything and something's nibbling at my ear and it's not Norman, oh God, I'm going to die, okay? I'm going to die. And so I went to the Lord and I said, here's your proactive servant. What do I do? I'm concerned. Different than worry. I'm not strangled. I'm not going to leave town. But what can I do? And the Lord said, shut the bathroom door. So the other day, just a couple of months ago, Norman said to me, about six months ago, something like that, recently, Norman said, why is it? Because he goes to bed before I do. And I come in a little bit later, and he says, why is it when you come in, you always reach for the door of the bathroom, and you shut the bathroom door? I said, because the Lord told me to do that. Because if rats come out, they're trapped, and you can kill them in the morning. And he started laughing. But it was reality for me, okay? It was a way to escape the strangling fear and phobia and worry of a rat invasion in my bed, okay? Now, we don't have rats anymore. Hopefully, we won't ever have any anymore, but they're not going to nibble on my ear out of my bathroom because I'm shutting the door, okay? So, it's normal to be concerned about life, our families, the things that we care about, and we should cry out to the Lord, and even with deep emotion and tears. We see the Psalms, they were written by King David because he was concerned. And God in the Psalms replied to him, I'm concerned about everything in your life. So let your concern and God's concern come into alignment together, but God's not worrying. And he tells you, do not worry. Don't get in to this downward spiral of just dwelling on something negative, preoccupying your mind with negative thoughts. Now, it says in, in Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He is our rest and peace. And so we can come to him. Now, it, a quote from a man by the name of Glenn Turner. I love this quote. He says, worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do but it gets you nowhere. Shall I repeat that? Worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. And we want to advance, even if we're concerned about lions, tigers, and bears. We're going to go forward. And the more we go forward and see the faithfulness of the Lord in the land of the living, more energy and skip will be in our advancement, just as we saw in Dorothy, the Scarecrow, and the Tin Man. So, worry is a sin, okay? It will rob us of joy and rob us of God-given opportunities. It is a sin. Now, that should convict all of us, because all of us worry over something in our lives. We don't need to throw stones at each other. We don't need to say, oh, 
he won't do this, she won't do that because they're scaredy cats, because they're worried. Well, we all are scary cats in some area of our lives, and we worry. But the point is, with the knowledge of the word of God, we can begin to decide to be concerned people and not worry warts and recognize that worry is a sin. Now, you can go to therapy, and you can spend a couple hundred dollars a session to get a therapist to help you manage worry. And that's good. I'm a counselor. I'm all for that. I think that's excellent to be able to get some management over your worry. But as new creation believers, as royal sons and daughters of God, we get more. We get more than managing worry. It's like saying, okay, you're an adulterer. But now that you've come to Christ, we're going to teach you how to manage your adultery. <laughs> God says, do not commit adultery. Or you're a liar. Now that you've come to Christ, we're going to teach you how to manage your lying. Do not lie. We're going to teach you how to manage your worry. Do not worry. I'm not saying that therapy wouldn't help us. But it's much more than that when we're in Christ. There is deliverance. There is freedom from fear, from insecurity, because we have the one who loves us and watches over us and says that there's nothing too high, too low, too wide, too deep that he's not in control of with his love toward our lives. He says nothing will separate us from his love. So... We can change and we can make a decision to live knowing God has a plan and the worst outcomes to birth benefit and blessing in our lives, all right? So in the process of change, God gives us grace. We studied about grace a few weeks ago, and grace is God blessing us when we don't deserve it. So even if you worry, know that God's grace is there. Don't put condemnation on top of the negativity of worry and just God's not going to do that he's not going to plaster you to the ground you're already negative and then you're going to condemn yourself because you're negative no his grace is there he says I love you I'm patient with you I want you to grasp this we can hear a lot of things with our ears, and a certain percentage will register in our brains, in our minds, but it takes a process for it to drop down into our spirit, into our heart, until it's written on the very essence of our being. And God is patient with that. He's patient with you. He's patient with me. But he invites us. You know, life happens. I'm looking at a, a couple here whose son went to Afghanistan. I mean, they can't go, oh, no, we never are concerned. We just believe in God. Hello, are you nuts? Okay, your son is in a war zone. Of course you're going to be concerned. But God invites us not to be strangled by worry, but to take that concern and give it to him. When you get a diagnosis of cancer or some other threatening disease, I mean, if you're just, oh, no, I just have faith in Jesus. I'm worrying about your sanity, okay? No, you're going to be concerned, but you're not going to be strangled with fear and worry and dwelling on death and destruction and pain and, and all of the horrors of the disease. But you're going to focus on the one who came to give himself for your eternal life. And even if this body perishes, your spirit, the essence of who you are, will live eternally. And you're going to focus on that. And you're going to say, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. I'm going to live to the full extent every day I have. But beyond that, I'm going to live better. Hallelujah. I'm going to live in another dimension. And I'm not going to be strangled by worry or fear. Life happens. When you think your child is in one place and you find out they're not there, that they've deceived you, that they've lied to you, and that fear, that gut-wrenching anxiety hits you, are you going to let it destroy you? Or are you going to say, this is not going to eat my lunch? 
I am going to concentrate on the Lord. He sees where my child is. He hears what my child is saying. He observes what my child is doing. He knows how to block destruction from my child. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe God for proactive ideas and solutions for my family because I'm concerned, but I'm not strangled by this. I will go forward to my destiny and being a living testimony, a living word, a living example of God's power in our lives. Okay, Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says, The Lord is the one that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear. Do not worry. Do not be dismayed. Is that okay with you? What are we going to choose? Are we convicted of worry? Some of us were raised by parents that worried about everything. And we just repeat the cycle. We don't know any other way to live. Today, you're invited to be concerned, but to be focused on Christ and to go forward. When we were going through our situation, a prophetess said to me, I was down in the middle of Mexico, and she turned to me, and she said, Sandra, I had a dream about you last night. And I said, really? And she said, yes. I said, if it's good, you can share it with me. If it's bad, just between you and God, okay? <laughs> and she said, no, let me tell you the dream. She said, I saw you in a car, and you were in a storm, and everything was dark and menacing, but you didn't stop. You kept going, and as you kept going, you left the storm behind, and you came out into the beautiful light and a beautiful rainbow, and the storm was a thing of the past. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Keep moving, keep moving. Whatever storm you're in, keep believing. Keep depositing your faith in the integrity of God. He loves you beyond your ability to understand. That's why in this church, if you're in a Bible study, in the Men of Promise, in Women United, in youth, whatever you're in during the week, you'll find that constant message, whatever else we're studying, your identity in Jesus, that you are a royal personage, loved by the king, a part of a royal family, and that he loves you with limitless love, and he overshadows your life with amazing grace. We've got to continually have that anointed word rubbing his oil of freshness over our lives so that we can live concerned but not worried. Amen. This is the end of the teaching from our pastors. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org or download our app in the App Store. Thank you for listening.